Let's move on to militarism, specifically the Anglo-German arms race that starts in the late 19th century. Okay, because both England and Germany are building up arms, historians essentially argue that World War I becomes inevitable at a certain point. Now, why are they building up arms like this? Well, again, remember that Germany unified by 1870 and it emerges as a great world power. But to really emerge as the supreme world power, you have to have a great military. And at that point, and for a long period historically, Britain had the strongest military out of all the countries in Western Europe. And so Germany realizes that now it needs to essentially produce much more industrially than Britain had. So it very quickly starts to do this. Now, in particular, Britain is paying attention to, Britain and Germany are competing with regard to their navy. All right, now Britain realized, basically Britain already had the superior navy, but it realizes that what it needs to do is continue to do so in the face of German expansion. There's a saying that the sun never sets on the British Empire. In other words, the idea is that Britain remains superior uh, and they will do anything to do so. The sun is always shining on them. So they develop a policy to ensure that no matter what happens with other countries' navies, Britain will have a fleet that still is larger than any two fleets combined. All right, so that basically means, okay, if you start to expand, then we're going to expand to counter you. All right, now you are going to see also some reactions against naval expansion in Britain. One example of that would be uh, the Haldane mission in 1912. This is against the naval arms race. A couple of other things that I did not include here, but that are in your notes, is you're going to see other peace movements or anti-militarization move movements, like Alfred Noble, who at first was on the side of militarism because he manufactured dynamite. He later um, becomes, he later uh, funds what becomes the Nobel Prize, right? Also, you're going to see an Austrian woman named Bertha von Suttner uh, become the first woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize because of her opposition to the arms race. All right, I just thought that that was me me worth mentioning because it didn't make its way onto these slides. Okay, now in terms of also just militarism in general, the Olympics are going to get reestablished in the 1890s. This is an excellent example of anti-militarism because you can get your aggressions out now through sports rather than military aggression. Okay, moving back to German uh, naval buildup. All right. Now, what happens in 1898 is that Kaiser Wilhelm II starts to expand the German Navy because it wants to protect its international trade that has been growing and its colonies that it has established since the Berlin Conference. Right. Um, so it ultimately realizes that the way to do that is to have a strong navy. Now, Alfred von Tirpitz is going to lead the naval buildup for Germany. Oh, and the Haldane mission, by the way, which I previously mentioned, was, um, was an attempt from a British person to try to end the naval arms race with Germany. I know I mentioned that twice, but this, that's where it fell in my notes. Okay, now, as a result of the arms race, by the time we get to 18, oh, by the time we get to the turn of the 20th century, or actually more like 1914, the start of the war, both Britain and Germany are going to possess dreadnoughts, which are super battleships with great firing range and power. This is a huge result of the naval arms race, and one of the reasons why it becomes so deadly. Also, I wanted to pay attention quickly to, um, to just how much military spending we're seeing throughout Europe, not just between Britain and Germany. All right, first off, you just see in general, the total figures are going to skyrocket. They are going to basically quadruple between unification of Germany and the outbreak of World War I. Also notice that out of the increases, the most significant one by far is Germany. This doesn't mean that Britain and France and Russia, well, Russia also is great. This is also still a reaction against the Crimean War and, of course, later the Russo-Japanese War. Um, but you also see that Britain and France do not increase as much, but that's because they already had strong militaries. 
Okay, dreadnoughts I already showed you. Okay, another major cause in the main acronym is imperialism. We talked about that last chapter, right? So we know that imperialism is, is you know, this kind of scramble for not just Africa, but um, also Asia, but really it's imperialism in Africa that's going to contribute to World War I the most, okay? One major example of tension that results from imperialism is the uh, Berlin Conference. Remember that Germany, because it enters imperialism late, wants to make sure that there's kind of an orderly way for these European countries to establish control over Africa, you know, orderly way to uh, carve up Africa, so to speak, all right? <clears throat> Now, Germany was very aggressive in its attempt to acquire colonies. And so this means that sometimes it came into conflict with other European powers. All right, so already one of the sort of sources of tension with the scramble for Africa is with Germany specifically. Now, you're going to see during the Boer War another more specific cause of Britain and German tension, and that takes the form, that takes form as a result of the Kruger telegram. <clears throat> so, what happens in the Kruger telegram? Again, the Boer War was Britain trying to get control of the Transvaal region, um, which, was, uh, which was occupied by Boers, descendants of Dutch settlers, and um, Britain ends up invading this region, and prematurely, the German um, Kaiser ends up sending a telegram to the Boers saying, congratulations, you were victorious in stopping the British. Well, ultimately, this doesn't happen. The British end up, end up defeating the Boers and establish the Union of South Africa. Okay, but at this point, we see it's, it's sort of this premature acknowledgement that the Germans are in support of the Boers, not the British. And uh, this is going to cause great tension between Britain and Germany. So the Kaiser Telegram is one example of how imperialism is leading to tension. All right, other things, the Moroccan crises, we're going to talk about two of them, one in 1906 and one in 1911. The first Moroccan crisis, well, we're going to go backwards a little bit, talk about how it was solved by something called the Algeciras Conference in 1906. Um, the first Moroccan crisis, what it is, is that the Kaiser in Germany uh, wants Morocco to become independent. Now, here's a problem. The French had established Morocco as one of its colonies. So basically, the Kaiser is trying to undermine French imperial influence over Morocco. Now, um, Britain and Italy decide to go ahead and support French dominance in Morocco as well as Tunisia. Okay, so why do they do that? Because they see Germany as a threat to dominate all of Europe and also to continue to aggressively expand into Africa. So Britain and Italy say, you know what? We're going to go with France on this one. <clears throat> so Germany de demands this conference so that they can establish whether Morocco should become independent or whether it should remain a colony of France. Now, much to Germany's chagrin, they, uh, the, the conference results in recognition of Morocco as a French colony, all right? So, how does this affect Germany? Germany becomes more isolated from these other countries. And the only country that supports Germany after the Algeciras conference in this matter is Austria, all right? So why did Germany demand this conference? He thought that Britain and France would be divided. He thought that France and Britain would be at odds with regard to Morocco. He thought Britain would actually deny France's claim, but they don't, all right, because both of them look at Germany as a threat, all right? Now, Germany argues that basically these other countries in Europe are surrounding them, ganging up against them, right? They say that this is an example of encirclement, right? So, yes, they are surrounding Germany and threatening it, okay? And when we look at the alliances on the map, it, it they are surrounding it, ultimately, but his, their claim of encirclement um, is going to be one of the reasons why they are continuously aggressive with these other powers. Now, we talked about the formation of the Triple Entente already. It's important to realize that this is one of the major contributors, the Algeciras Conference and the results thereof, of the formation of the Triple Entente. They need to do something to protect themselves against Germany. There's also a second Moroccan crisis. Okay, so Germany is not finished with, um, with uh, France's claim in Morocco. 
All right, so the second conference starts when Germany sends a gunboat to Morocco because they don't want the French to occupy a city there, a city called Fez. Now, Britain, again, ends up siding with France, all right? Now, at this point, we had the Entente Cordiale ever since 1904. Remember, this is a friendship between Britain and France. So because of that, they say, yeah, of course, we're going to side with France. France has claim in Morocco. Now, at first, the Entente Cordiale, it literally means cordial agreement. But after they decide to side together as a result of this conference, it more or less becomes a real alliance. All right. And um, so, so this is very significant. Um, it also, in a lot of ways, many historians argue that this conflict also predicted world war. Um, now, Germany ends up backing down because they get some concessions in equatorial Africa. So the second Moroccan crisis ends, but still, you see Germany be at odds increasingly with France and Britain. Okay, another cause of nationalism, or of the war, war that is, is nationalism in the Balkan region specifically. Historians refer to the Balkans at this time as a powder keg, meaning that it will explode at any minute. Now, we've already talked about the Eastern question before, but let's return to it. Remember how the Ottoman Empire has been declining for a while now? It's referred to as the sick man of Europe. That other lack of quotation mark is going to drive me crazy. So as the Ottoman Empire shrinks, the question becomes, who's going to replace them? Who's going to become the powerful influence in this region? Now, the Slavs want to be sovereign, ultimately. Okay, so you're going to see the emergence of something called Pan-Slavism, which was a nationalist movement to unite all the Slavic people in this region. Okay, so basically they wanted to have really a singular political entity. They wanted the Serbs, the Bosnians, the Slovenes, and the Croats to all be, to, to all form together and become a single political entity in Southern Europe. Russia decides to back the Serbs in this effort because Russia claims that it is the Slavs' big brother to the East. Okay, so Russia is going to end up focusing on these um, Balkan territories and, um, and this is going to make it, again, increasingly tense with Austria and Hungary because they also have interests in the Balkan region. Okay, this also is a result of Russia losing the Russo-Japanese War, and so it shifts its attention to the Balkans. All right, so the first Balkan crisis, it's also called the Bosnian crisis. Now, the, the Ottoman Empire decides to set up a parliamentary government. It is set up by a group called the Young Turks. And uh, it is actually somewhat politically progressive. What it wants to do is modernize the Ottoman Empire to prevent it from collapsing. Now, it ends up looking still weak enough to the other European powers because it's just starting to develop. And so this is a signal for other uh, European powers to maybe start challenging the Ottomans by taking land. And you're also going to see that the Russians and the Austrians are going to quickly interfere with the Balkans before Turkey gets strong enough to resist. So, what initiates the Balkan crisis is that Austria ends up annexing Bosnia-Herzegovina, which is here on the map. Okay, so this was a Slavic region, but yet becomes part, a de facto part of Austria and Hungary. Now, this action actually violated the Congress of Berlin. The, the Congress of Berlin said that Austria could administer Bosnia Herzegovina, but could not actually own it. All right. However, this first crisis does not result in a war. First off, because Russia is not ready militarily to go to war. It had just ended the Russo-Japanese War and, of course, the Russo-Turkish War. And France decides that it doesn't feel like going to war in the Balkans is worth it. Okay. A uh, 15-minute mark is rapidly approaching, so we'll start off the next video with the First Balkan War.